Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's a real honor to be back here at this beautiful church and congregation. Uh, I don't know how to say it without being misquoted, but I do love coming to Las Vegas. Uh, somebody will blog about it now and uh, make a big story about that. But you know, there's so many wonderful things in this city as well. I'm a great uh, culinary buff. I love the great foods of the world. I've always been that, and unfortunately, the older you get, the less you have the capacity to hold it in without it pushing out. So I just do my best, but uh, your pastoral team has been amazingly generous and kind, and uh, I have several of my colleagues here. We're filled up to the hilt, and the uh, food has been absolutely splendid, and also saw your Golden Knights do a great job on the Canadians last night. Now, having said that, I may not be able to go back home because my wife was born in Montreal. So I have no doubt she'd be a big Habs fan. But you know, a game's a game. You can enjoy it if you watch a, a great player at any play. You just enjoy watching it. And I'm a lover of cricket and hockey. I lived in Toronto for 10 years, and it's been many, many years since I've been at a hockey rink. It's a beautiful one. And uh, I don't often have the privilege of having my son with me, but Nathan is here with me as well, and we just enjoyed the game. So thank you, thank you so much. We really do hope we can come back. It's a beautiful city with great food and so many attractions uh, and distractions. Uh, <laughs> we'll avoid the latter and keep up with the former. It's just fascinating to watch people do the things they do. and. Uh, just gives you more illustrations for life, you know, and you move on. But thank you, and Pastor Derek, I don't know where you're seated right now, sir, but thank you for your kind words, and Paul Gracie, leadership team, Rocky, and uh, Sheila keeps us with all of her goodies, and uh, we're truly blessed. Thank you for your kindness. We travel a lot. We're away from home a lot. I'm away from home over 200 days a year. And you know, when you can have this kind of warmth and fellowship and love and friendship, uh, I'm on the, closer to the finishing line than the starting line. And the sunset years, but next month I'll be turning 72. Uh, so it's uh, not exactly uh, in the peak of life. But when I look at K. Arthur, I've still got a long way to go. So I'll be all right, I'll keep going. So may I propose to you, March 3rd, don't tell K. I said that, you know. Uh, isn't she amazing? Absolutely amazing. I don't know what her vitamins are, but I'm going to be taking a hold of them as well. But to plan that mission, you know, I'm a, I, I was raised, uh, after I moved to Canada, in a missionary church. I'm a missions-minded person. Our team, nearly 75, come from 15 countries. We love the languages of the world. We love the foods of the world. We love the peoples of the world. It was Augustine who said, the world is like a book, and those who don't travel have only read one page. When you travel, you read a lot of pages and learn. And so missions has changed, remarkably changed. But if I were to ask you a question today and say, which is the fastest growing church in the world? Many of you may have the answer to that, but it was the most surprising answer a few years ago. Nobody ever dreamed of it. The fastest growing church in the world is in China. 25 years ago, nobody would have guessed it. The work that missionaries did over decades and decades and decades the seed was sown, somebody else was planted, and today the Chinese people are among the most sending people in the world and the most generous people in the world. The first 30% uh, of the funds given to build our Apollo Apologetics Institute in Atlanta came from Chinese Christians. So you sow, and then God gives the harvest. If I were to ask you which is the second fastest growing church in the world, I doubt even 10% would have the answer to that because even I found that out just last month when I was visiting Egypt and Jordan and other countries. The second fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. Primarily amongst the young. So this is the day of missions. Don't let anyone convince you that it's over. There's a different focus, a different approach, a different umbrella, a different way you even get into the country. But get a missionary burden in your heart. For God so loved the world that he sent. 
As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Between sending and praying and giving, uh, we will accomplish the dream that Kay was talking about of getting the word to the whole world. Set that day aside on March the 3rd. Bring your friends, but most importantly, bring your heart and will and ask God to speak to you. Wonderful things can happen in your own life. I also want to encourage you to be back tonight to listen to my colleague, Abdu. He's one of the finest expositors of the world. He is Lebanese born, uh, raised in a Muslim home, came to know Christ. We team up together many, many times. Tonight he's going to deal with the thorniest of all questions on God and the problem of evil, God and the problem of pain, God and the problem of suffering. Your city has witnessed that some months ago. Florida just witnessed it. But pain goes beyond the immediate of a violent act. Pain can become a perpetual companion in your own heart because someone has said virtue in distress and vice in triumph makes atheists of mankind. So bring your questions, and I'm positive Abdu will have a response for you that will minister to your heart and your mind. Many of you in 27 groups are involved in the Everyday Question series, which your church has invested in so much. My colleagues are involved in answering those questions. There are really four questions that form your worldview, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. All the other subsets of questions come from these four. If you're not part of those group, enroll. This is not to make you a mass evangelist. It is to make you a focused evangelist. Your neighbors, your friends, your family, who ask you pointed questions. And you know what's the best thing that'll happen? Your own questions will be answered. We all have them. We all struggle with them. Moses had them. Jeremiah had them. Habakkuk had them. Paul struggled with it. And so everyday questions for everyday people because all new news is old news happening to new people. All new news is old news happening to new people, which is what Malcolm Muggeridge said. So please enroll in that and you will be better equipped and always be prepared to give an answer and the reason for the hope that is within you. That's what the Lord asks of you and me. I wanted to say all those preliminaries, not because they are merely preliminaries, but they lie at the heart of what life is all about in a church and ministering to you and preparing you. Today I want to talk to you a little bit in the minutes that remain of how do we do apologetics in this critical 21st century? We call this a post-truth generation. Imagine that, post-truth. What it's intended to say is that truth is no longer a legitimate category in the minds of people. I define it as no matter what a person posts is taken to be the truth. <laughs> That's really what has happened in our time. And Millions of dollars are being spent right now, even as I'm speaking to you, to bring together a consortium of European thinkers to ask the question, what does post-truth really mean? And does it truly imply that this generation no longer believes there is such a thing as the truth? But as they are fine-tuning that research, do you know what they're concluding? It's not so much that people don't believe there is such a thing as the truth. Everybody who's on the wrong side of an issue desperately believes in the truth because they want the person on the wrong side to be on the right side and the world to come on the right side of the issue. If you accuse me of something that is false, I would desperately long for the truth. So whenever wrong is involved, there's somebody who is right and somebody who is wrong and the person who is wronged by someone else desperately longs for the truth. So what it is they're de concluding is this. It's not so much that people no longer believe there is such a thing as the truth, but people don't really know where to go for it. They're blogging from every different direction, advertisements and messages and seductions and reductions and accusations and court cases and investigations and special prosecutors. All of these people are being involved and everybody has an opinion so that we are bombarded on every side and we don't know where to go for the truth. But the most important question in life boils down to this, why am I here in the first place? What is life really about? 
it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how successful you are or how happy you may be with many, many things, you still have to ask the question, why am I here in the first place? Is my life really going to come to an end after my three score years and ten? Is the lowering of that body into the ground truly a final goodbye? Or is it a transition to the arena from the keyhole of which you understand all of reality? Is that what we ultimately need to see the whole art gallery and see through the keyhole what it is that life really is all about? So what is apologetics? Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which literally means to give an answer to. The word logic is already in there. To give an answer to, and Peter says, to anyone who asks of you the reason for the hope that is within you, and to do that with gentleness and respect. So the point is, you do not deface the questioner. You affirm the question and respect the questioner and clear away the bushes that stand between the questioner and the answers so that they can take a direct look at the cross. That is the task of apologetics, to clear the obstacles so that people will take a direct look at the person of Christ. And I always add one more sliver that is important to that. It's not only giving an answer, but it's making truth claims clear. You have to be clear in what it is you're saying. At the day of Pentecost, when God was in many ways so visible, people were still confused. They were confused. And Peter, this ordinary fisherman, who is the one who told us to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within us, he stood up and said, let me explain. This is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. And all of a sudden he connected the dots to the people who had been raised with the Hebrew scriptures and now witnessing the descent of the Holy Spirit, confused right down to the depths. He says, this is exactly what Joel talked about. And the moment he opened up their eyes to an understanding, the church of Jesus Christ was planted with the Holy Spirit endowing men and women and sending them into the uttermost parts of the earth so that today there's almost no country in the world where there's not at least somebody who has heard the name of Christ and knows that he came as Lord and Savior of mankind. So how do we proclaim that truth in a post-truth generation where truth is so muddied and so terribly confused? Somebody wrote this many years ago. In the 1950s, kids lost their innocence. They were liberated from their parents by well-paying jobs, cars, and lyrics and music that gave rise to a new term, the generation gap. In the 1960s, kids lost their authority. It was the decade of protest. Church, state, and parents were all called into question and found wanting. Their authority was rejected, yet nothing ever replaced it. In the 1970s, kids lost their love. So lost innocence, then authority, now they lost their love. It was the decade of meism, dominated by hyphenated words beginning with self, self-image, self-esteem, self-assertion. It made for a very lonely world. Kids learned everything there was to know about sex, forgot everything there was to know about love, and few had the nerve to tell them that there was indeed a difference. In the 1980s, kids lost their hope, stripped of innocence, authority, and love, and plagued by the horror of a nuclear nightmare, large and growing numbers of this generation have stopped believing in the future. And I added this, in the 1990s, kids have lost their power to reason. Lost in the world of cyberspace, they have now personalized object and to objects and totally subjectivized reality and imprisoned now in their own walls of loneliness. Subjectivizing reality, totally inside of you, and yet the deeper and deeper you dig, you say, I really end up having more questions than I have answers. How do we deal with this generation and really in our own struggles for answers? The thing is this, 
the best illustration I have to present this to you is goes something like this. I have a friend who's a medical doctor from the Middle East. And I remember many years ago sitting in his home having a meal with him and his wife. And he said something to me that caught me completely by surprise. I'm still not sure I fully fathom it, but I get the gist of what he's saying. He was quite young when he had his first heart attack as a medical practitioner. He said, I am a diagnostician. I diagnose people's maladies, and I have done well with it. When somebody comes to me and says, my arm is hurting or my hip is hurting, my job is to diagnose the source of that pain. Is this coming from the hip? Is this coming from the arm? Is it coming from the spine? Is it the back issues that are radiating into the hip? He said, I have to diagnose to know the source of the pain. Because until you diagnose it correctly, you'll only be dealing symptomatically. You won't be dealing with the cause of the pain. He said, but Ravi, when I had my heart attack, I was in a completely different frame of reference. When a person comes complaining of pain, they talk about the pain as an appendage to them. My wrist is hurting. My knee is hurting. My hip is hurting. I'm in pain in these areas. He said, when I was in the midst of a heart attack, in the throes of it, he said, I was struggling just to stretch my chest capacity to accommodate the pain. And the only way I can describe it to you, he said, is, I was not feeling pain, I was in the pain. He said the organ intended to generate life was generating pain. It was not part of me that was hurting, it was my whole being that was in pain because the organ that pumps out the blood and life was in trauma and getting damaged. He said, that's all I can say to you as a doctor, I was in the pain. I'm not sure I fully grasp it, but I think I get a general idea of what he is saying. But here's what I want to say to you. When we talk of this postmodern, post-truth, skeptical, cynical culture, it is not an appendage to what we have. We are in it. We are trapped by it. We are forced to think like it. And because we are so immersed in this culture, we latch on to approaches and ideas that sometimes we don't realize we have even made the gospel to become a part of the problem when we have compromised the essence of the gospel in order to accommodate the means that we think are appropriate to disseminate them. The substance of it is lost and the form of it has so morphed that sometimes we can't tell the difference between a commercial that's advertising for the personal seller's gain or that which is being presented for the consumer's gain. The gospel cost our Lord everything. And you see, if we don't understand this, we won't understand the gospel. I said to my wife the other day after the Florida shooting, the price of freedom is huge. The cost of freedom is huge. And the biggest cost we had better pay is in the disciplines and the character with which we raise people who live with the privilege of freedom. If there is no character for a free people, freedom becomes destructive. The huge cost is in character building. See, I love my freedom. I love to be able to have access to whatever I want, but if I don't have the character to make the right judgment, to make the right call, to consume the right product, that which was intended to be a privilege becomes the very means of my destruction. So the cost is very real. And I want to talk to you about three or four changes that have taken place in our culture over the last 100 years or so and what it is going to take to get the gospel to be recognized for what it is. Number one is the popularization of the death of God and a willingness to live with its ramifications. It was in 1900 that the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche died. He was born in 1844, died in 1900 at the age of 56. His father was a pastor both of his grandfathers were pastors. Nietzsche repudiated belief in God. 
and he pointed once to a piano and said that had more of a soul than actually he did. It is a fact that is um, known from his biography that he had lived a somewhat promiscuous life, how much people don't know, but he contracted a pretty severe case of venereal disease. In the last 13 years of his life, he was sort of struggling in moments of sanity and insanity, clarity and confusion. Whether the one played into the other is a debate among scholars, but we do know what actually uh, took his life ultimately, that he was gone fairly young. Michel Foucault, also a French thinker, who believed there were no boundaries to life, that you ought to live any way you wish, died in his early 50s, had contracted, sadly, HIV AIDS, and he was a big hero and a faculty member, but he lived pretty, pretty sadly, and ultimately, with a life without boundaries, uh, his body told him, there, are, there have to be boundaries. You can't really live in a boundaryless world without ultimately plundering your own health and your own well-being. These are bright men. These are brilliant men. And you often wonder what a different life it could have been if they had monitored their own disciplines and given the world some beautiful novels and beautiful stories and beautiful lectures for us to learn from them but they believed in a boundaryless existence because there was no God. And that boundaryless existence caught them short and let them know there are boundaries. You cannot cross lines with impunity. There are boundaries for you and for me. But with atheism, we've come to the conclusion that ultimately you are the definer of your own values. You are the definer of right and wrong. It is impossible in a city like this with all the wonderful bright lights and all the privileges not to walk past the tables and see how people can squander so much in such few minutes and literally burn that which has been entrusted to them. While there are millions all over the world with that same burning of the money had it been invested in some young life who knows? You could produce another doctor. You could produce another minister. You could produce another benevolent person. But here we are so trapped in the immediate that we lose the value of that by which we have defined our value. It's critical for you, especially young people, to understand that there are, there are moral absolutes. There is a right. There is a wrong. There is a point of reference for why you and I ought to live the way we were designed to live. If you take a car and use it as a weapon, you are not using the car for the purpose for which it was built and so wonderfully put together. If you use your life for a purpose for which you were not designed, you also will self-destruct and take many along in the path with you. There is an absolute, there is a right, there is a wrong. It was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who wrote thousands and thousands of pages. When he made the comment, made it so astutely, he said, I always remember as a young lad in Russia, living in my home with my family and my grandparents, and at night in the darkness of a home, they'd be sitting around a table talking. And night after night, it would be my grandfather who would talk to us and talk to the family about how grim the reality had become. And it would always end the night the same way with my grandfather getting up from the table and making this comment. Do you know why all this is happening to us? He would say. Do you know why all this is happening to us? It's because we have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. When you forget the source of your life and breath and health and strength, and the moral reasoning that he has given to you and the conscience that he has placed before you. It is a critical thing to understand that it is for a purpose that God gives us a conscience. It is for a purpose that he brings us to hear messages. It is for a purpose he's given us this word. And thy word is truth and the scriptures cannot be broken. When you break the word of God, you don't really break, your, break the word of God. You break yourself and prove the word of God to be true. The one who wrote the most protracted chapter on the word, that how much he loved the law, is the man who learned how pivotal the law is from after he broke it. 
When you see David's writing, thy, how I delight in the law, how the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and it's sweeter than the honey is uh, from the honeycomb. He learned that the hard way after he had crossed certain boundaries. And so I say to you, the willingness to live with the ramifications of a non-theistic or an atheistic framework are huge. We are living in a deadly world of death and destruction. And the weapons as they pile up are put in oftentimes into the hands of people who have no moral boundaries or somehow have lost the capacity to even think clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, those who believe there isn't a God will ultimately get everyone around them to be paying the price as well. It's a costly thing. And what Nietzsche ended up doing was a huge blunder. The popularization of the death of God and a willingness to live with its ramifications. If you are willing to live with a subjectivized reality as if there is no objective truth, as if there is nothing out there to reveal to you right and wrong, if that's the path you choose, you will be paying a very heavy price and the price will ultimately be in your own life. But there's a second change that took place in the last century. It was the gathering storm of religious pluralism and the disorientation of Western culture. The gathering storm of religious pluralism and the disorientation of Western culture. I got a letter from a Chinese businessman. I don't agree with this conclusion, but what he said, had a reason for its saying. He's a good friend, he's a fine man, and he wrote to me and said after the Florida shooting, I suppose now, your next university forum, they're going to ask you, where was God in all of this? I think it was Anne Graham Lotz who said it best years ago. I'm quite sure she was the first one to say it. We've kicked him out of the schools. We've kicked him out of politics. We've kicked him out of ethics. We've kicked him out of our homes. We have prohibited his use in any public setting. And then when tragedy strikes, we want to know where he is. <laughs> Fascinating repercussions, isn't it? But this Chinese businessman gentleman said to, in his letter, and I'm telling you, I'd, I didn't agree with this conclusion. He said, America's finished. He said, there's no future for America. They will no longer be playing that role. He may be missing one thing. God is a God of transformation, change, and God of hope. I hope you don't believe that. And as I'm preparing my response to him, I want to say I sincerely hope you don't believe that. Because when you look at what happened in Rome, as Rome was dying, you see all of a sudden the sun shining in the, in, the, in the darkness of those hours when Rome had fallen 400. But all of a sudden the gospel had taken place because of the work of the Apostle Paul. I'm reading a book now on the biography of Martin Luther. It was in the dark days where the church was so messed up and so confused and how Luther got the scriptures printed in their native tongue and changed. Yes, we may go through swings, we may go through cycles, but I have the hope because of churches like this because of the kind of leadership you have, because of voices that you're going to hear of men like Abdul Murray and all later today and tonight, that there's going to be hope. God can take one person and change history. God can take one person and change history. And the more the world moves into darkness, the more you don't have to remind them how dark it is. All you've got to do is shine a light. And somebody says, that's really what I want. But the confusion of religious worldviews, the confusion of religion did throw the West into a kind of, 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 of a disoriented thinking. How much do you know of the gospel? How much do you know of the scriptures? How much time do you take each day to understand what it is that God really is trying to say to you and to me? If thy word is truth and the scriptures abide forever. You know, uh, my grandson Jude, he's six years old. And last week well, on Valentine's Day is his mother Naomi's birthday. She's my daughter. And as they were passing the gifts around and the cards around, here comes Jude with his card to give to his mom. And in that card it says, you'll never know how much we love you, referring to his brothers and sisters. He's the oldest. 
And then on the inside of it, he writes, heaven and earth may pass away, but my word, the word, my word abides forever, says the Lord. Six years old. So I said to Jude, where did you get that from? He said, I have my own Bible, Papa. I have it upstairs. And I took the Bible and I wrote it from there. <laughs> my son was sitting around the table for that conversation. And as I look at all of these grandkids, with the way they, he himself is a father of a lovely little girl who's four, and to hear them singing the choruses, hear them singing the hymns, hear them quoting the scripture, that is the hope. That is the hope for the future. Read the word. Understand the word. Know the difference. Know the difference. There is a unique difference. Can I give you just one line of difference that you will not find in any other worldview? Any other worldview of any religious stripe whatsoever. The gospel is the only message in the world that tells you you cannot pay for all the wrongs that are there in your life. That it is a gift Salvation is a gift. The word of God is a gift. Grace is a gift. This is exactly what turned Luther's life around. Luther was not a bad priest. He was a good priest. But he was haunted by the fact that he had never ever freed himself from the burden of all of his hidden sins. His father confessor would tell him, go back and get some sleep. I need some sleep. Wake up in the morning. Don't keep on coming back and forth. One more thing that I forgot. One more thing that I forgot. One more thing that I forgot. He always was haunted by the reality of sin. Till the book of Romans turned his life around. The book of Romans turned the life of Augustine around. It turned the life of Wesley around. It turned the life of Luther around. Probably the greatest treatise on the justification by faith. Faith is a gift Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. You cannot earn it. Amen. This is unbelievably so. Understand it. Thirdly, it is the power to inform through the visual. We are now learning through the eyes rather than learning through thinking and reflecting. If you see a 30-second clip of some situation, you think you have all of the news on that. And the news thrives on the camera. Years ago, years ago, Malcolm Muggeridge, the great English journalist, was attending an execution in Biafra. He was watching a group of political prisoners about to be executed. And the firing squad was ready to go. It's a true story. He tells it in his book. I think it's, a Christ, it's Christ in the Media. The political prisoners are lined up. The executioners are ready. They take and they hear, ready, aim, and a scream stops them. Stop! My battery is dead. <laughs> it was a television cameraman. And they stopped the execution. And Muggeridge made the comment, some future generation will ask the question, wherein lay the greatest barbarism? On the part of the political demagogues, on the part of the executioners, he said, some wise person will plump for the cameras. <clears throat> he was a media man, and he realized how the visual can so easily distort reality. We are given frames, when truth is framed in a way almost to become a falsehood. You see, Truth is primarily the property of propositions, statements. I'm not at all demeaning. I think the camera is a wonderful thing. My wife and I were recently in the Caribbean. I remember standing one night and taking the picture of a sunset in Grenada. It was absolutely splendid. And I thought of what uh, um, G.K. Chesterton once said. Because I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, we don't appreciate sunsets because we don't have to pay for them. And G.K. Chesterton said, Oscar Wilde was wrong. You can't pay for sunsets by not living like Oscar Wilde, he said. He said, the beauty is this. You can be in awe of a sunset, but the sun will never return the compliment. The sun will never be in awe of you. Why? 
because you and I are made in the image of God. We have the power to reason, the power to think. And unfortunately today, pictures are taking away from us. The picture has a value to support a thought, but if you make the picture the ultimate thought, you will miss the context, and any text devoid of a context will become a pretext. You will use it for all of the wrong reasons. I say to you that the eyes are very critical to viewing reality, but the Bible says if the light within you becomes darkness, how great is the darkness indeed. The eye is the lamp of the body. Make sure that lamp is lit through God's word. That's how you do it. And so you take the changes, you take the changes that atheism has brought, a willingness to live with it, the confusion of worldviews and watching through the eye gate without the context of, the, of thinking and knowledge. What are the answers? I give you three very quick responses. Number one, the question is this, how do you really reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? Okay? How do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? Here are my three responses. Number one, the gospel is not going to have to be just heard. It is going to have to be seen. People will have to see the gospel. They will have to watch the gospel. They will have to see the gospel at work. And so if your light doesn't shine before human beings so that they don't see your good works, they will not really glorify your Father who is in heaven. You have to be one in whom the gospel is seen, not just heard. Proclamation comes through the ear gate, but conviction often comes through the eye gate. When somebody says, there is a person in whom the Holy Spirit truly dwells, in whom the Holy Spirit of God truly lives. I remember once, some years ago, my wife and I were at church. And there was a pastor, I don't even know if I've ever used this illustration, just came into my mind. We were sitting in the audience and there were a handful of people who were really roughing him up. Really roughing him up. It was a sad thing to watch happening. And the man just sat on the chair and listened to it all and he never said a word except the tears started rolling down his face and he was wiping those tears away. And I just watched all the vitriol and all that was going on and I said, I don't know what is and what isn't, but I'm looking at a man who is displaying such grace and such courtesy and such gentleness. That's why at a point even Jesus never answered Pilate because to give truth to him who loves it not is to give them only more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. So said George MacDonald, to give truth to somebody who doesn't love it is to give them only more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. But you're going to have to live it. If the accusation is true, then you have to face it. But if the accusation is false, you have to learn how, in a Christ-like way, to respond and live it. If the, person, if, the, if the critic of the church says, we don't really care for the needy of the world, then take it to heart and ask yourself, is that a true criticism of you as a person, that you don't really care for the needy of the world, or that you don't really listen, or you don't really read your word, that you don't practice it? Whatever the accusation is, take it to heart and say, is this true? If it's true, learn how to correct it, deal with it, so that they will see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. You know. Uh, my wife, uh, she's a bigger reader than I am. For every book that I've read, I think she's read 10 or 20, and I'm not exaggerating. She just, that's why she's very easy to take on a vacation, you know. <laughs> she just reads. I, I said to her recently, I don't know why you go on a vacation. Because whether you're in Atlanta at home or whether you're in Grenada, you're doing the same thing. You're reading. <laughs> It's just that every now and then you may hear a different sound outside the window, but you're reading. <laughs> she's bright, very, very bright. She said, what would you like to do? I'll do it. Yeah. But she's just be reading. My little uh, grandson was running around the house making a nuisance of himself, <laughs> running everywhere. And he stubbed his toe against the corner of a wall. And he, screaming, blue murder. So I was on the verge of saying to him, what do you expect when you run around like this? 
and said, you know what my wife did? She picked him up, put him on the kitchen counter and started to kiss his toes. And she said, Jude, I know that hurts. That hurts really badly. But the good news is the pain will go away. And she just held that little foot and kept kissing it away. And I thought to myself, how bright. You know. <laughs> Do you think it would have done him any good for me to say that's what you get from running around the house? You know? <laughs> what good did it do for his grandmother to kiss those toes? For him to know she really loved him. That's why when he phones, most of the time he phones her. You know, <laughs> talks to her. I'll tell you what, we have to learn how this generation feels. And you have to be able not just to talk but let them see. It's an apologetic that is gonna to have to be seen. Number two, it's an apologetic that is not merely argued, but also felt. There has to be a conviction in your heart. Do you feel the message in your heart? Do you feel the truth of Christ in your heart? You know, I have my colleague here, uh, Sanj, and uh, no matter how he prays or where he prays, he had a dramatic conversion. I think some of you heard him. He always begins by praying, Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. That tells me right off the bat uh, what it is he's most grateful for, apart from everything else, that there's a salvation that was provided in the son. And when you feel that transformation, I don't hear too many philosophers or others talking anymore about the reality of a relationship. It's very important to have that relationship. And so I'm asking you, do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ today? Do you know he lives within your heart? Do you sense him speaking to you? Do you sense him near you? Do you know he loves you, cares for you, that he came to change your thinking, that he came to change your heart? Doesn't matter all the arguments that you have, do you have the felt reality of God's presence? The prodigal son may have had many arguments given to him while he was running, but I strongly suspect what brought him back home was the memories of home. All the good memories of home and the love of his father that ultimately brought him back and said, what am I doing here with these hogs when I could be back home and the embrace of my father? So it's an apologetic that is not only heard but has to be seen, an apologetic that is not merely argued but also felt, and lastly, an apologetic that doesn't only rescue the ends of where we are trying to bring people to in the end, but the means, and it is the word of God that has to be given to people, and only then faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word is the centerpiece of God's gift outside of his holy presence. He gave us a book. He gave us his words. I have a friend who is a Jewish convert who made the comment at my friend Nabil Qureshi's funeral. He made the comment, he said, you tell anybody you know to read the Gospel of John three times through completely, and all, most of them at the end of it will say, there's something supremely powerful in this particular word, the word of God, as the word became truth and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Take that word, embrace it to your heart, and whatever your argument, remember what you're trying to get them to is that relationship with Jesus Christ, but what you win them with is what you may win them to. And we have to win them with that holy word, because that's what we are trying to win them to, to the truth of God, to the word that cannot be broken. So as I close, I close with an illustration. You may be familiar with it. Uh, you know, they say old age is when no matter what anybody says, it reminds you of something else. <laughs> no matter what anyone said, it reminds me of something else. You know. Years ago, 1939, I wasn't around then. <laughs> but the world was on the brink of that disastrous war. And the more you read of the history of World War I and World War II, you begin to see the chain of events and how incredible it was of how one thing led to another and one single shot 
was heard around the world, and the world was changed in such dramatic ways. King George VI had a stuttering problem. The king stuttered when he spoke, but he had to speak to the world, and so he drafted a speech to calm the nerves of the world, himself actually in the early throes of cancer and knowing he would need those very words himself. But just before he went to speak, his 12-year-old daughter, the present queen, gave him a piece of paper in which she had written these words. Those words are the best remembered portion of the speech. Very few people know it was given by the 12-year-old daughter. Said this, I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. I said to the man at the gate of the air, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. How do you put your hand into the hand of God? The only way I know it is on your knees and with your heart in his word. When you hear his heart, you're putting your hand into his hand. When you're kneeling before him, you're bowed before his holy presence and saying, speak, Lord, I need you to address me. I don't know what you're going through personally today, but it may be you needed this word for your own heart, either to come to know Christ because you've been running from him. All kinds of things can be going on in your life. All kind, every one of us has those. Or it may be that you once upon a time made that commitment, but you're following so far off that today you want to say, Lord, I need a fresh touch from you. I need a fresh sense of your presence. I don't want to just talk about this life. I want to know this life. I want to live this life. And you want to put your hand into the hand of God. If you don't know him, make that commitment this morning. If you do know him, but you know you're really not walking with him, will you make that decision to turn things around? Would you bow your head and pray with me, please? Father, we need you as a nation. We need you in our states, in our cities, in our homes. Whatever else the city proves, Lord, it proves the incredible power of the imagination, both to do right and to do wrong. This is one of those cities where the glitter is so bright and yet in a marvelous way you have placed your people in this city to show them where the real light is. And may the light from this congregation ever shine brightly. Thank you for the courage of those who planted churches here and anywhere else. Thank you for my brother Derek and his entire leadership team how kind they have been, not just to us, but to so many. Minister to them, Lord, this day to refresh their own hearts. We have a need of a fresh touch from you in our homes, in our lives. And Lord, speak to this congregation right now to bring conviction of those who need to turn to you. God has spoken to you this morning and you know you need to come to him or turn away from a path where you were headed and say, Lord, hold me by the hand and turn me around. I want your life. Will you just slip your hand up and put it down? I would love to pray for you as we close. Thank you on my right. God bless you. Thank you. Yes, in the middle here. God bless you at the back. On the left there. Yes. Thank you, sir. On my left. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anyone else? This is really a moment between you and God. Thank you. I see that. Really a moment between you and God. Thank you, sir. If you have raised it once, you don't need to raise it again so I can recognize the new hands. Thank you on my right. What's important is, yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. 
what's important is for you to recognize that you need to make that commitment to God and he will hear your cry. He will hear your cry. So I look around for about 30 seconds more. Maybe you're really struggling. Please just hold it up high and say, Preacher, pray for me. Thank you. Right in the front, this young man. God bless you. God bless you, sir. And others are being pointed to. I can't see. Yes, another young man here. Thank you. Thank you. Right at the back. Thank you, sir. Lord, you've told us in your word, them that acknowledge me before people, I also will acknowledge before my Father. Pursue these individuals and more so that today will be the day of reckoning for them. And this day will not end without them being on their knees and saying, it's a new beginning, Lord, with your strength and your voice and your grace. Thank you, Lord, even as I commit myself to you afresh to do your bidding, to serve you with my whole heart. Take us and use us so that men and women will follow you for yours is the supreme name. And it's in that supreme name we pray. But I thank you for giving me the honor of being here in this church and with these wonderful people at your appointed time. In our Savior's name, amen.